and get started. Welcome to this latest edition of Curator Conversations at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. My name is Elizabeth Darling and I am the manager of membership in annual giving here at the VMHC and we're so glad to have you here uh, for this program. Before we get into the program, I do want to go over housekeeping. If you are having any technical issues during the program, please reach out via the chat function in the Zoom and uh, myself and Haley Fenner, our tech guru, will do our best to assist you. You do have the option to see the closed captioning, so to see the, the live subtitles during the program, that is an option in the Zoom uh, program as well. Again, if you have any questions about that, let us know in the chat. Uh, we will have time at the end of the program for questions. So if you have any that pop up during the program, please feel free to add those to the chat or to the Q&A. And I believe with that, that is all my housekeeping for this program. So again, welcome, and I will turn it over to our um, presenter for this program, Dr. James Brooks. He is uh, a somewhat new addition to our staff. We are very excited to have him. He is our Melanie Trent DeShutter Library Director here at the VMHC. And he's originally from England, but is most recently from the Newbury Library in Chicago, where he was a research fellow. And uh, I will turn it over to him for the main part of this program and take it away, James. Thank you so much for that really generous introduction, hey, uh, Elizabeth. And obviously thank you to everyone for taking the time to attend this presentation today. Um, I've got a lot to get through and maybe I won't even get through that. And there's a lot more I wish I could have got through as well. So I'm gonna make as quick a start as possible today. So let me just share my screen and make a start. So, the smoke had hardly cleared around Fort Sumner in April 1861 when the American art community joined, a, joined an ever intensifying chorus of voices stirred by the outbreak of civil war in the United States. As war fervor swept the nation and Americans of all sections and stations vied to thunder their premonitions of the coming conflict, picture makers and critics attempted to make sense of the role of art in the divided nation. Charles C. Ingham, the president of New York's National Academy of Design, warily observed, war and politics now occupy every mind. No one thinks of the arts. Even among the artists, patriotism has superseded painting and many have laid by the palette and the pencil to shoulder the musket. Union for the country is the word on every lip and the feeling in every heart. So for Ingham, internal conflict would compel artists to cast aside paintbrushes for guns. War and politics were separate from art. Patriotism was distinct from painting. The attack on Fort Sumner signaled a call to arms to artists and a suspension of their everyday aesthetic pursuits. But as Ingham called for artists to go and fight, others alter offered alternative assessments of the role of creativity in wartime. Perhaps it was actually the duty of artists to stay in their studios and paint patriotically, as many saw a renewal of pictorial culture and the arts inspired by union conflict and armed uh, sentiment. Excuse me one second. Historians Stephen Kahn and Andrew Walker note that Americans shared widely in the view that patriotic duty entailed both a military and a cultural service. But their enthusiasm would dissipate quickly like smoke off the battlefield as people's moods and the war itself became increasingly grim. While throughout the war a broad commitment to the positive and patriotic depiction of the conflict remained per pervasive on the surface, a closer look at the wartime visual culture of the United States reveals a much more varied image. And on the front lines of this cultural contest and conversation with ordinary men who made up the rank and file of the burgeoning armies of North and South. They took up paint, pencils and paintbrushes and commissioned portrait photographs to depict the war and their place within it. 
Developments in antebellum technologies and visual culture had facilitated a far-reaching mainstream culture of what was essentially idealized warfare. As modernization characterized many aspects of the Civil War, so too did it shape visual culture and its many forms through lithography and engraving, and also photography. Positive war pictures, those that heroized and sentimentalized the experience of war, trumpeted the superiority of one's own soldiers while emphasizing the supposed inferiority of a morally degenerate enemy. War was said to be a noble and uplifting endeavor, and even its most violent aspects could be portrayed as a purifying force. For many Civil War soldiers, such romanticized depictions did not prepare them for the realities that they came to know during the conflict. John D. Billings of the 10th Massachusetts Battery would write, some of us had dim remembrances of a Mexican war in our early childhood. We only remembered that there was a Scott and a Taylor and a Santa Ana from the colored prints we had seen displayed of these worthies. This, of course, was utterly inadequate to do the subject justice. So lived experience jarred uncomfortably with these mainstream popular depictions of conflict. And from 1861 to 1865, as popular culture seized upon engraving and print media, soldiers began to counter its proliferation by employing more traditional forms like sketching and painting, and by turning newer technologies like photography towards their own personalized self-representation. Soldiers mused upon imagery in their correspondence and in their diaries, and they pen critiques of the romanticized exaggerations that were exhibited in the pictorial news and in printmaking. And ultimately, many of these soldiers pictured battles, camps, and marches that were devoid of the heroism that was so essential to many of these mainstream depictions. There was essentially a groundswell in grassroots artistic and visual production amongst ordinary American soldiers. These volunteers had experienced the emergence of accessible forms of photography and pictorial news during their upbringing, and they essentially entered civil war familiarized with the changing role of visual culture, with the changing role of visual culture in record keeping, in maintaining relationships over the great distances that were inherent in the expansion in the antebellum period, and as a widely accepted purveyor of truth. Having a picture taken was a ritual for many recruits upon their entry into the army. The taking of a photograph, whether described in correspondence during the war or reminisced about in a memoir, was a defining moment of the civilian's entry into the army. Gazing at a likeness before mailing it off, in, uh, off to family in Pennsylvania, one soldier, Jesse Bowman Young, recognized an expression about the picture that seemed to say, the country has been waiting for me, and here I am, ready for duty, accoutred for action, prepared to crush the rebellion at short notice, and thus save the land and the flag. The great object of my appearance on the scene is to quell the disturbance and summarily put an end to the hostilities of the war. This revolt will not last long after I commence active operations against the enemy, and all I ask is a fair chance to get at him. So this sense of self-agency that volunteers had was, was really heightened during the early period of the war. And many believed themselves of capable of great martial feats on the battlefield. Oftentimes we see soldiers talking about how one Southerner or one Northerner could take on 10 of his ad adversaries. In the early stages of their service, battle seemed remote to them and a lack of military experience made its horrors quite incomprehensible. So here we see that Jesse was using the photograph to affirm his new martial identity, changing from civilian into soldier, and to almost secure his place in the war's history. So I wanna look through a couple of the photographs that we have here in the collection. Some of you may recognize this half plate ambrotype taken in 1861 or 1862. Um, and this was because it was featured prominently on Bell I. Wiley, uh, Bell I. Wiley's pioneering study, The Life of Johnny Reb. It depicts Louisianan Thomas Taylor in uniform, holding a rifle with a bayonet in a martial stance. The note inscribed on the paper and held within the case gives details of Thomas's service, and it identifies his pride in having served with, the, with Stonewall Jackson 
particularly during the Valley Campaign of 1862. So you can see how the photographs are really being used as points of pride for soldiers. This emperor type depicts um, who is believed to be Ludwell Robinson Temple on the left and John Taylor Temple on the right. And Ludwell and John were from Fredericksburg, Virginia, where John would work as a store clerk and they enlisted together in the 30th Virginia Infantry. John had quite a uh, remarkable service. He was promoted to corporal and then to sergeant and then elected, elected company, uh, lieutenant of his company by the end of 1862. And while John survived the war without serious wounds, the war would ultimately take quite a fatal toll on his health. He contracted malaria in 1864, and he tried without success to resign or obtain a certificate of disability, passing away at around the age of 30 in 1870. If we look carefully at this photograph, we can note that it's got colored paint applied to it, notably in the addition to the lips and the cheeks of the subjects, and also with this gold paint that's been applied to the breast and belt plates. This, this function was usually carried out by a photographer's assistant and was seen as quite rudimentary work in the photography studio. And it operates not only to add color to the otherwise quite dull tones of the photograph, but its application, as you can tell, is, is remarkably selective. Um, it draws the viewer's eye towards John and Ludwell's countenances, uh, to the expressions on their faces, and also serves to highlight indicators of their service and patriotism through their belt uh, and breastplates. And soldiers employed these photographs as innovative component, components in their correspondence and used them as a way to mediate distance between themselves and their homes. For civilians, securing the absent soldier's portrait in the domestic sphere allowed them to retain semblances of friends and kin who had departed for war. And the balladist E.W. Locke noted that the volunteer's picture was, quote, the last and most precious memento the home circle has. These mementos exist in every town and country, uh, every town and hamlet in our country, which really speaks to their widespread use and, and, and just the, the explosion of their presence across, across homes in America during the Civil War. Civilians treasured these portraits in the hope that the actuality depicted in the photograph remained, that essentially that the portrait photograph was an authentic miniature of something that was an ongoing reality, that the soldier remained alive and well. At the same time, the soldier, as he departed home, felt urged to ensure that a physical presence of himself remained in the home, even if his body would not return to that space. If a soldier did not feel the urgency to, fence, to send a photograph home, family and friends were quite quick to insist upon his sending of one. In the Casey papers held here at the BMHC, we find an incident where William Casey of the 4th Virginia Heavy Artillery was actually pursued by his mother for over a year to send a photograph home. Quote, tell mama that it is true that I did promise to send her my likeness, but it is entirely out of my power for there is nobody to do it, so I cannot send it, wrote William from Camp Gloucester Point in Virginia on July 9, 1861. A year later, in the summer of 1862, photography came up in his correspondence again, as he assured his mother that, quote, the likeness you shall have if I can possibly get to Richmond. Still under pressure in December of 1862, so nearly a year and a half later, he again broached the subject. I expect to go to Richmond in the later part of this week. Then I will try and have my likeness taken and send it to you. The following week, Casey was finally able to report to his mother that I had my daguerreotype taken for you. I had to pay $10 for it. And it had taken Casey a year and a half to have his picture taken, but when all was said and done, he was hardly satisfied with the photograph. He wrote, I think I am better looking than the likeness. Portraits were tools of connectedness during the Civil War that allowed the martial and the domestic spheres uh, to be fused together in periods of detachment and uncertainty. Portraits of family and friends also comforted soldiers on the front lines. This 1863 Harper's Weekly image by Thomas Nast depicts soldiers, uh, soldiers on the one hand and civilians on the other, and they're separated from one another on a Christmas Eve. 
It literally shows them occupying separate spheres, but photographs are how they remain connected to one another. If we look to the soldier on the picket line at the right, we see that he's gazing at a photograph. And if you blow this up in great detail, you can actually see a female figure on one side and two children on the other. And then if we look to the woman in her, in her domestic space uh, at home, on the home front, we actually see in the sort of top left corner of her sphere, the photograph of the soldier looking down on the family watchfully as the children sleep in their beds. Imagery appeared in other media that soldiers used to remain connected to their families. Most common, particularly between 1861 and 1863, was patriotic stationery. And this material bore patriotic emblems and idealized pictures of military heroes, of engagements, and of soldier life. The historian Stephen Boyd states that they promote patriotism, disseminated political information, and reflected the motives of Americans and most of the common, uh, or the most common designs were based on flags. Moreover, as J. Matthew Goldman has identified, Americans in 1860s simply had no reason, how to no reason to know how to respond in a war and crisis of such magnitude. And so what print culture did was that it offered a roadmap as to how citizens should respond to the crisis. Ephemera and popular prints remain not only as indicators of popular sentiment in the Civil War, but almost as instructional tools that, that told Americans what their sentiment should be and how they should act in wartime. These examples were used by Charles H. Ashton of the 1st Delaware Regiment and sent from Norfolk to his mother, Emmeline. He sent them in the early years of the war and they feature bold devices that, which essentially allow him to signal his patriotism and to align with the Union cause, even as his letters relay the sort of dull and routine particulars of everyday life in a Civil War camp. Here we can see two examples from the Moyer family papers. John and James Moyer served in the 26th Virginia Infantry and used these decorated letter sheets in their correspondence. While the icons are perhaps less visually striking than their Union counterparts, which is something that itself speaks to the more developed print industry in the North, they serve the same function, containing references to abstract symbols and concepts such as freedom, country, liberty, home, and of course, the flag. And it wasn't only commercial forces that played a role in disseminating these sorts of pictures and in communicating patriotic imagery and slogans. Soldiers themselves took cue, cut cues from the market, as did civilians, and they played their own part. Jane Wolseley of New York recalled that at the beginning of the war, her sister Eliza sent for a large number of very small testaments for knapsacks for the Fishkill Regiment. And we have found some sheets of flags on paper, like stamps to paste in, in them, each with appropriate verses. Fight the good fight, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, etc. Alexander Stone of the 11th North Carolina sent this undated letter to his wife, Rebecca, which features a hand-drawn North Carolina state flag with the identification of Bethel in red and blue beneath it. And you can really only see the, the letters Beth, E-L uh, 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 depicted very, very smallly in this picture. The Bethel Regiment was his unit's nickname. And so we can actually see how uh, Alexander was following the conventions of commercially available print imagery to produce his own design that was relevant to his more particular circumstances. It recognizes his regiment and his home state in contrast to those broader appeals we just saw to the entirety of the white Confederate South. Before the advent of patriotic stationery in wartime, pictorial envelopes and letterheads usually featured partisan or political causes, or were used more generally to transmit pictures of places or scenes of note. Here we can see one unknown soldier's pencil sketch on an envelope, which was intended for recipients in Alabama, and it depicts quite accurately the Nelson House at Yorktown which was a colonial home built around 1730 and damaged during the siege of Yorktown in the Revolutionary War. Items like this were essentially early modern postcards, 
and they allowed individuals to maintain visual contact with distant correspondents and to be able to introduce certain locations, events and people to those who were not physically present. One soldier, Alvin Kovoris, whose papers we hold here, uh, he served in the 67th Ohio. He actually noted that the widespread popularity of the illustrated newspapers encouraged him to submit sketches with his wartime letters. In December 1863, he wrote home to his wife Lydia, quote, illustrated papers are all the rage now. And to be up with the times, I thought it best to illuminate my letters with some first class sketches. So we can see how the commercial success and popularity of illustrated journalism and of print imagery actually eventually pressures soldiers to start to begin blending their textual accounts of the war with visual accounts in their correspondence home. Life in more static camps presented opportunities for soldiers to sketch and doodle. Compared to more active campaigns when they were marching, fighting and generally exhausted. This sketchbook was kept by Benjamin Lewis Blackford and filled with drawings through the year of 1862. Lewis, as he was known to his friends and family, had worked as a surveyor before the Civil War, and this was an occupation that would have required some technical skill in drawing. He joined the 11th Virginia Infantry before serving in the Engineering Corps, where he was able to put his surveying skills to use in drawing maps for the Army. Lewis's sketchbook became a means for him to collect a personal record of his comrades and the scenes which he encountered during the war. In this sketch seen at right, titled Camp Near Richmond, Surgeon's Quarters, we see one soldier slumbering against a wagon as a convalescent lies asleep outside of the tent's entrance. In another, a depiction of two officers sharing a meal while using a supply box as a table emphasizes the striking contests um, to enjoyments that soldiers might enjoy in civilian life. This scene shows the camp of the Richmond Howitzers featuring a row of tents, a soldier on guard, horses and artillery wagons. And in the blank space to the left, we see how Lewis actually acknowledges his artistic lim lim limitations. He writes, two additional caissons and four pieces, referring to artillery pieces, are to be understood being too troublesome to sketch. While Lewis made no claim to be an expert sketch artist, he did take time to depict his comrades in intimate and personal ways. At left is a seated portrait of one R.C. Sibley, an assistant adjutant general, and, in, and at right is a bust of a profile of an individual known only as the quartermaster sergeant. That Blackford was making these, these sketches in his personal book infers that he was collecting a personal record of the men in his regiment rather than actually providing them to the subjects themselves to keep for themselves. And this is important because historians generally recognize Winslow Homer, who was the celebrated Civil War sketch artist, and, and here we see the front cover of his, his work campaign sketches, He's generally recognized to be the first wartime artist to make an effort to restore compassion for combatants through these thoughtful pictorial studies. But as we can tell, soldier artists depicted themselves and their associates with careful attention from the moment they entered service, understanding that the larger forces of the war would or could do little to record their essential selves, their lives in such intimate terms. And ultimately, it was Winslow Homer's own embeddedness with Civil War soldiers that was integral to his artistic evolution. Of course, many of the men who served in the Civil War had not enjoyed the same graphic training that soldiers like Lewis Blackford used in wartime, but they still sought to depict the, their place in the war on their own terms. This sketch by Kennedy Palmer, seen in a photograph to the right, depicts the mess camp at Company H of the 13th Virginia Infantry after the first Battle of Bull Run in 1861. It was drawn on July 23rd, about two days after the fighting, and shows soldiers lounging and smoking in a camp in the woods. While we cannot say with certainty whether Kennedy also attempted to make a sketch of the first Battle of Bull Run, we do know that his regiment was not actually engaged there and was instead assigned to guard duty nearby. 
but other Confederate soldiers who participated in that first major battle of the war actually noted the shock of the violence that they saw them, that they saw around Manassas, and argued that books on war that they had read as civilians before entry into the army had done nothing to prepare them for combat. One soldier in the 6th North Carolina Infantry wrote to his father, quote, such a day, the booming of cannon, the rattling of muskets, you have no idea how it was. I've turned through that old book of yours and looked at the pictures and read a little about war, but I did not know anything what it was. Now, we'll return to battles later, but as I previously mentioned, it was in the more monotonous periods of the war that soldiers were permitted the most time to make pictures. Florence McCarthy served in the Thomas Artillery Battery and found himself in Northern Virginia during the winter of 1861-1862. In one letter to his sister Jane, Florence hinted at both the comforts that could be enjoyed in a static camp as well as the tedium of winter in wartime. After noting that the fireplace in his quarters provided plenty of heat, he wrote, my bed is a little more difficult to describe, but I will try it. And he went on providing these step-by-step -step illustrations that you see on the page now to illustrate each step of how he crafted his bed. On the reverse of the letter, Florence included a depiction of the inside of his habitation, which he referred to as his house. He noted, well, here you see the inside as well as I can draw it, which is well, well enough to do credit to the old masters. Do not think the cat under the bed is a fancy touch, for we have two. Do not think either that the gentleman sitting in my bed is in a fit of blues, for that is a common posture for a tired soldier to sit in, his elbows on his knees and his head in his hands. So while Florence's illustrated letter evidently results in part from the boredom of winter quarters, it also derived in part from a place of pride. Soldiers, many of them who were completely unfamiliar with the work of keeping a home and in executing domestic tasks that were usually reserved for women in the mid 19th century, looked upon these tasks with a mix of curiosity, frustration, anger and amusement and often pointed with pride when they were able to master comfortable quarters and satisfactory meals. Here we can see another example in US cavalryman Thomas Place's sketch of his quarters in Williamsburg from 1862. And it's ironically titled Our Shanty, despite being ably constructed from logs and featuring a plank roof and a brick chimney. This pencil sketch and watercolor by John J. Omenhauser of the 46th Virginia Infantry depicts a much more lively camp scene. And it fit, features the Richmond mess of the Richmond Light Infantry Blues preparing a meal in a comic style, complete with text that identifies each individual down at the bottom and speech bubbles that allow them to speak and comment upon their individual tasks. The historian James Broomhall has analyzed a similar depiction by Omenhauser in his work on Confederate soldiers and their emotional worlds. And he notes that pictures like this demonstrate the competitions over resources in camp, the battles over controlling who performed which labors, and more generally, the sort of com confining and tense atmosphere that a Civil War camp could often be. Ultimately, while many of the popular mainstream depictions of camp showed ordered rows of tents, soldiers on parade, Omenhauser's scene is a much more chaotic, busy, and ultimately a noisy one. At left, one soldier complains that he's actually been eating so much pork that he feels as though he has hog bristles growing all over him. To his right, another threatens that he will, quote, break the head of any man he catches using the clean water that he has just gathered. The man leaving, leaning over the fire complains that the kettle won't hold enough coffee for the, for the men gathered around. And the soldier engaged in chopping wood at right complains that he must be due for a discharge for he thinks that the work he is doing is so, is so intense that it's causing him to suffer heart palpitations. The two men before the fire are busily engaged in making biscuits. And while the soldier at left compliments his comrade on his skill at making them, stating that no man could do so better, the other retorts, and there is no man that can get ahead of you in eating them. And if we notice behind this lively camp scene, 
And in one of the tents, soldiers are seen playing cards and one smiles over, uh, smiles over his hand as he gazes at it. So Omenhauser sought to depict camp life in a way that did not shy away from the, the tensions experienced by Civil War soldiers, nor the vices that they endured in, or, or they enjoyed in camp. Notably, Omenhauser focuses on the often conflicting personalities of the men in camps, even when they were bonded together in these small groups to cook, clean, and endure together. This lithograph depicts soldiers of the 47th Ohio Volunteer Infantry in 1861, and it was made from a sketch completed on the spot by one J. Neck Rosler, then a corporal in Company G of that same regiment. Now, Rosler had worked as a, as a lithographer and landscape artist before the war, and his work address was actually shared with Ergot, Forbridger and, Com and Company, which is a prominent lithography firm in Cincinnati, Ohio. And he most likely worked for the company, or at least had contracts with them, because they were the ones who printed this, this lithograph that we see here and would do so throughout the war for Rosler. As Mark Neely and Harold Holder have stated about Rosler, uh, he's largely been forgotten by Civil War historians. And this is because he often depicted minor battles in the early stages of the war. And he had a focus on infantrymen that was not necessarily shared um, by, the, by the more successful newspaper artists, um, at least in that early war period. While others featured more striking images of officers, generals, cavalrymen, and artillerists, Rosler depicted common soldiers and was forward-looking in his focus on soldiers conducting the more routine activities of army life, such as being on picket and sentry duty. In this lithograph, we can see Union soldiers huddled around a campfire um, and in their greatcoats. They're topped with these broad brim brimmed hats that, that cover their faces and they have their hands stuffed into their pockets. At right, we can see a crude shelter. And if you look closely, you can actually see the leg of a sleeping soldier jutting out. While Rosler was certainly making military images, they were not particularly patriotic or militaristic in their nature. And in fact, in his wartime portfolio of over 20 prints, only one of them featured a flag. Moreover, his skill in depicting landscapes is quite evident. While the human figures are ably represented, they are not the focus of his work. Instead, the soldiers are actually dwarfed and dominated by the Western Virginia landscape all around them. The landscape is depicted as dramatic and the soldiers appear quite forlorn and vulnerable. And having just looked at Omenhauser's rendering of soldiers around the fire in the last slide, we can imagine that these pickets are less focused on the nobility or the righteousness of their cause and more focused on venting their frustrations at the inhospitable climate all around them. Similarly, Thomas Place, who we met earlier with his sketch of his winter cabin, depicted a hard march of cavalrymen through a driving snow in April 1863. Humor, one of the many coping mechanisms for soldiers, whether in camp, on the march, or even in battles, is notable in that Thomas has titled the scene a Sunny South Scout. As Union soldiers came south with the war, they eventually came into contact with free black communities and enslaved people. Depictions of black Americans are quite common in Union soldiers' visual culture, particularly when compared to that of Confederate soldiers. And I think this results in part due to Confederate soldiers actively sidelining the contributions of black men and women who were coerced and forced into service for the project of Confederate nationhood. But also we must remember that Northern soldiers were essentially fascinated by unfamiliar Southern communities and cultures that were largely unknown to them except through popular culture in the North and their curiosity shows in their depictions of African-Americans. While Thomas Place never included a depiction of a white Southerner in his scrapbook, he filled it with drawings, um, he filled it with uh, several prominent sketches of black Virginians. Depictions of black Southerners also appeared in other forms of Civil, Civil War soldiers' visual culture too. Pliny Jewett of the 1st Connecticut Cavalry took on the role of editor for his regimental newspaper, which was titled The Blower. 
Though produced in a simplistic style, his papers were alike mainstream pictorial uh, newspapers in many ways. They featured an illustrated masthead, made references to our artists and our correspondents, and often included a comic page um, that, that featured cartoons on the reverse. In the top half of this sheet, we can see an enslaved woman depicted conversing with a white southerner. And although their relationship is not explained, we are left unsure as to whether the man is the woman's master or enslaver. As the woman holds out a clean shirt, he asks, is my washing ready, Topsy? And we must pause here and first recognize that the name Topsy was one that was popularized in Harriet Beecher Stowe's 1852 novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Topsy was a fictional character, an enslaved child, who was depicted with such degradation resulting from her dreadful treatment in slavery that she largely serves in this book as a entirely oppositional figure to little Eva, who is a white, angelic, and pure-hearted girl that eventually um, passes away in the novel in an incredibly dramatic scene. Again, we can see how Northerners are taking cues from popular culture. In the blower, Topsy replies in a plantation dialect, another blatantly racist framing drawn from mainstream depictions of African-Americans. She says, here is your shirt, master, but you see, I don't take Confederate money anymore. You see that the Union soldiers have brought down the good old stuff with them, real gold, and I rather guess your shin plaster are about played out. And by shin plaster, she's essentially referring to worthless Confederate money. It's a complicated picture that despite the deeply prejudiced tropes that we can see, shows enslaved African-Americans in the wartime South with new agency, even if the woman's Advantage, advantageous position is entirely dependent and predicated on the presence of Union soldiers. They have not only brought with them the gold-backed currency, which she so desires, but their occupation of Southern territory emboldens the woman and permits her to reject racial and social protocol in her, in her interactions. Though images of emancipation and new African-American agency did abound in Northern popular culture during the Civil War, we see that Jewett's cartoon assumes the contributions of Union soldiers in elevating the status of Black people in the South. And although it has these undeniably racist features to it, particularly with Jewett's employment of a plantation dialect, the image does ultimately offer a soldier-centric view of some of the transformative societal shifts that occur occurred during the Civil War. At bottom right is a second picture, excuse me. It's titled A Raw Recruit. It depicts a soldier in a prim uniform, even featuring piping down his trouser leg with a knapsack that's full and topped with blankets and adorned with camp equipment. His stiff collar calls to mind the insult to paper collar soldier, a, which was a derisive term used by soldiers against those who they believed to be untested and unable to endure the rigors of army life. The subject's exaggerated features are reminiscent of the stylistic devices employed by artists producing comic valentines, which were satirical ca uh, cartoons at a popular art form during the war. Jewett's second cartoon is another soldier-centric depiction, and it's one that works to distinguish between different types of soldiers in the army. The raw recruit was perhaps not as disagreeable as the more infamous bounty jumpers, soldiers who would enlist in one place, desert only to enlist in another, collecting the bounties for service, but he's clearly still not earned entry into the circle of veteran soldiers. Soldiers came to know that um, despite the very proud uh, portraits that their, their, their photographic portraits that they had um, made themselves when they were quite naive recruits themselves, they came to realize that worn down figures were far more accurate depictions of what a true soldier looked like after that initial excitement in war had passed. So in contrast, pictures like the, the, the raw recruit shown here in Jewett's newspaper give, give troops a almost like a visual template with which to categorize those that they considered to be poor soldiers, or at least not soldiers to the same degree that they were as veterans. And it certainly wasn't just ordinary soldiers who received such criticism from their comrades. As we can imagine, this was also directed to generals and officers as well. 
Alvin Kovaris, who was the soldier that I introduced earlier that wrote of the um, popularity of newspaper illustrations and how it pressured him to start to include sketches in his own correspondence, launched into a damning attack of the illustrated newspaper's habit of boosting the reputation of incompetent leaders. Boris wrote, Admiral A wishes to win his laurels easily. He knows it's much easier to fight, uh, to write than to fight his way to glory. He employs an artist and a special correspondence. The pictorials represent him a la Neptune with 15 inch guns protruding from his breeches pockets, horse pistols in his bootlegs, mortars in his cap with a cutlass 40 feet long in his right hand. $50 makes Frank Leslie believe this, and this is a reference to Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper. And the point is gained. He is a hero. Immortality stares him in the face. The general employs the same agencies, and he too goes to glory. So Boris was damning these officers that, that could essentially purchase fame with money rather than sacrifice and bravery. More broadly, Dewitt's rudimentary emulation of the Northern Pictorial Press offers us a glimpse into how soldiers could counter and supplement mainstream media. These pictures demonstrate that soldiers did, did crave a responsive record of the conflict and one that put their own experiences, perceptions, and attitudes at the forefront. For many soldiers, the most common, um, or sorry, for many soldiers, North and South, the most impactful and yet infrequent experience they had in the Civil War was that of combat. Popular depictions of battle, those in print imagery and in illustrated newspapers, like this example, which depicts the Battle of Petersburg in 1865, focused on the heroism and discipline of volunteer soldiers, the inferiority of the enemy, and a focus on patriotic symbols like flags, whilst also showing the, the apparent excitement and sanitization of combat. This is a Courier and Ives lithograph. Courier and Ives printed countless uh, depictions of Civil War battles during the war. And even though it's hardly as partisan and idealized as some of the earlier depictions in the conflict, it still shows rows and rows of Union soldiers. You see them stretching into the, into the distance maintaining this miraculous order and discipline despite meeting their enemy in close combat um, and showing you know, the explosion of shells all around them. If we look to the bodies that are, that are depicted at the bottom of the screen, we can see that despite the tremendous and destructive power of Civil War weaponry, um, all of the bodies are remarkably whole. Notably, if you look very carefully, you can see on a few of the deceased individuals, you can see blood exiting from wounds on them, but this is only limited to the Confederate casualties. There's no, there's no blood being depicted uh, as, as flowing from any of the, the US soldiers here. And if, again, you can see through the, through the, through the use of uh, coloring in this image, that only one Union soldier is clearly identifiable as actually having been uh, wounded or killed in this assault. If you look to the caption at the bottom of the print, you can see that references are made between the clash between Union heroes on the one side and the rebel hosts on the other. And the battle is said to end with the total overthrow of the traitors. So pictures like these made a, a very actual and tremendous contribution to, to, the, to the war effort. They rallied Americans, they inspired volunteers to enlist, and they ensured the soldiers continued devotion until the conflict closed. In fact, one Confederate soldier, Carlton McCarthy of the Richmond Howitzers, featured these propagandistic images into his reasoning for Confederate defeat after the Civil War. And he actually wrote, the Confederate soldier fought bounties and regular monthly pay. The Stars and Stripes, the Star Spangled Banner, and all the fury and fanaticism which skilled minds can create. He fought good wagons, fat horses, gunboats, and illustrated papers to cheer the boys in blue with sketches of the glorious deeds that they did not do. Here's another lithograph uh, by the Union soldier Jaynette Rosler. And although it depicts a fairly minor battle, the Battle of Carnifex Ferry, taking place in September 1861 in Western Virginia, 
Uh, this was a fairly small engagement that involved around 7,000 soldiers in total. Uh, it was a decisive victory for the United States, and it would actually result in the Confederate withdrawal from Western Virginia that helped facilitate the creation of the state of West Virginia in 1863. Rose's lithograph shows a federal assault on, the, on a Confederate camp, which is seen kind of partially obscur obscured in the smoke in the distance. And um, it shows shells bursting among soldiers, scattered uh, solid shot across, across, the, across the floor, which kind of demonstrates the hail of artillery fire that's been directed at the Union soldiers. Um, and although it's a chaotic scene that captures the shock of battle as, as um, experienced by many Civil War soldiers, we still see a fairly sanitized view. It's one that minimizes the damage that Civil War weaponry brought upon its victims, and whether this was a choice by Rosler himself or the firm that printed his pictures for sale, we do not know. But generally, trained artists avoided depicting violence and particularly the suffering of killing at the, at the moment of happening. Lithographers generally knew also that overtly violent scenes would not find a market among Americans. And it's important to remember that this is being published for commercial sale during the war. A really good example of this is in 1862, when Winslow Homer, the, the uh, newspaper sketch artist I was talking about earlier, he submitted a sketch of skirmishers fighting outside of Yorktown in Virginia uh, to Harper's Weekly. One of the Union soldiers was depicted actually being struck in the head by a bullet, and you can see his hat flying off. But in the picture that was eventually published by Harper's Weekly, the soldier had undergone a resurrection and was depicted alive and well. Similarly, after the Battle of Antietam, when um, Alexander Gardner's photographs of the dead of Antietam were re remediated for publication in the Illustrated Press, landscape scenes without bodies were featured most prominently, and the scenes of the dead soldiers, notably only of dead Confederate soldiers, were minimized to the extent that their graphic detail was actually stripped away. These battle pictures often gave way to more propagandistic representations that sidelined violence. And when they did depict the death of one of their own soldiers, they generally did so through heroic and virtuous symbolism. And I think something else that is evident is in this picture is uh, Rosler's strengths as a landscape artist. You see the attention to detail with which the trees and the buildings are depicted. And while the soldiers are depicted in quite dynamic poses, which extenuates their movement across the field, um, ultimately we see that Rosler's strength is in his, his pre-war uh, occupation as a, as a landscape artist. This drawing by Thomas uh, Place, who again we met earlier, uh, memorializes a comrade in a way that emulates the strategies of popular print culture. Even though it depicts a private soldier being killed by a bushwhacking sharpshooter um, in a fairly minor skirmish on a cavalry patrol. A central scene is surrounded by smaller vignettes and they are divided with this furled American flag that works its way around the picture. We can see Henry Weinholt, the victim, slumping forward at the head of this troop, killed by a Confederate who has taken the patrol by surprise. Um, from behind a tree. And I think this also speaks to, you know, this propagandistic nature of depicting um, the, the, uh, the opposition as morally degenerate, hiding in battle. Um, and if we look to the vignettes that are kind of pictured around this central scene, we can see in the top right the ensuing skirmish, which takes place after the assassination of Henry Weinholt. In the bottom right, we see his comrades firing a, a salute over his grave. And at bottom left, we see his grave site, um, which is obviously meant to emphasize the fact that Henry has been able to enjoy, in the relevant circumstances of the Civil War, a fairly normal death where his body can be identified and buried properly. It's unique that Place produced such an elaborate commemoration of his comrade's death. But with his creative tendencies and his access to artistic resources, he could offer what we could call a more customary reverence that was too often denied to, to other soldiers that were killed in the more escalated phases of the war and in those more intense and greater battles. 
This drawing shows a, a dead US Suave at the Battle of Second Bull Run, quite possibly either of the 5th or 10th New York. Um, and he's pictured against this setting or rising sun in the background. The picture itself is incredibly ambiguous, making it fairly open to our interpretation. And it was drawn after the battle by George and Henry E. Terry, one of the many Peach State soldiers under General James Longstreet, which faced off against the dramatic attack by the Zwarves at the Battle of Second Manassas or Bull Run. It poses a lot of questions to us. We could ask if Terry was viscerally celebrating his enemy's defeat, you know, with the decline of the United States pictured in this setting sun in the background, or perhaps it was a new day for the fledgling Confederacy that could only be, sec be secured through violent acts. Ultimately, it could be neither. Instead, the result of an individual shock at seeing the destruction of those Zouave regiments, which was, as I said, an incredibly dramatic scene, and one that the New York Tribune described as a field where they lay, nearly a hundred of them, shattered, torn, and bloody in every conceivable stage of misery. Pictures like this also call into question the internal struggle that countless Civil War soldiers battled with, as the work of war marked a significant departure from their understandings of themselves as human beings and Christians. For many, the destruction of Civil War battlefields distorted the lines between cold-blooded murder on the one hand and justified killing in wartime. And while some soldiers averted discussing or even, you know, picturing violence, often in an attempt to meet masculine um, expectations of the period, which dictated that men should remain calm and in control even when met by the most impure sights and violent scenes, we see that others, including perhaps Henry here, began to navigate soldiers' anxieties in thoughtful pictorial studies that signal both the impermanence of a soldier's life in war and the fragility of the idea of a normal and attended death, which is something I'll, I'll speak briefly about as I close up. The sketch's very ambiguity speaks to the uncertainty of conflict, as the Union soldier lies unidentified, alone, far from home, with only Terry, the sketching soldier, there to attend to him. Now, I want to close this talk with a focus on the photographic portraits that we began with. As I said, exchange was a fundamental feature of soldiers' engagement with photography. And as important as sending a photograph home as a proxy for the departed soldier was the soldier's desire to have photographs of loved ones from home in an effort to mediate those great distances opened up by the war and to stave off the almost uh, constant sense of homesickness that many soldiers felt. Photographs could also help soldiers manage their own passing. The concept of the good death was a prominent ideal um, that regarded the way in which one should die in the mid-19th century. And it essentially dictated that death should occur with loved ones in observance. They would take note of the dying's last words and offer emotional uh, comfort and reassurance. Meanwhile, and in contrast, an unattended death signified a great spiritual loss. Drew Gilpin Faust has evidenced the ways in which soldiers spent their last moments often communicating with representations of absent loved ones, whether through letters or pictures. Soldiers employed photographs in the management of the psychological and physical demands and stresses of war. This scrap of a letter written by Captain Roberts Coles of the 46th Virginia Infantry was directed to his fiancee Jenny before the Battle of Roanoke Island in North Carolina on February 7th, 1862. His regiment was sent to reinforce an embattled Confederate garrison, but would arrive only in time to surrender to victorious Federals. On one side of the note, which was written hastily on a, on a scrap of paper, as you can see, as he entered into battle, it reads, the battle has commenced. In five minutes, we will be on Roanoke Island. The site is beautiful. Our gunboats and batteries are engaging the enemy in full view and the shot and shell are whistling around us. If I fall, God grant you a happy life, as happy a one as I would have tried to have made it. Be assured my thoughts of you, uh, my thoughts on, my last thoughts on earth will be of you, my dearest Jenny. Your picture will be the last sight I shall see if time imparts me to look once more upon it.
yours forever, Robert Coles. And on the other side, he writes again, I have just a moment to write, the shells fly thick. So he's literally writing this note as he's going into combat. Robert Coles would die the next day. <clears throat> and whether he was able to look at Jenny's photograph or not is unknown to us. But he made it significant he made its significance explicitly clear in his letter. The image would conjure up her presence and offer comfort by permitting him to see his loved one one last time in life before, quote, meeting in the world to come if denied that blessing again here. Soldiers used letters and photographs in this way to indicate their preparedness to risk their lives for what they perceived to be a just cause in war. And they signaled to others that when they would die, they would attempt to do so in a calm and confident manner, and that they would enter into heaven with Christian dignity. Civil War soldier artists ultimately were individuals with diverse approaches to the representation of war. Pictures like Thomas Place's depiction of his comrade Henry remind us how sentimental and patriotic expectations did imbue the visual world that soldiers lived in and would influence soldiers thinking and action in the field. On the contrary, pictures like Henry Terry's depicting that deceased federal soldier emphasize that soldiers were never beholden to powerful cultural imagery in such a way that it stripped them of their ability to see the war on their own terms. Many soldiers did begin to reject overtly propagandistic depictions by around 1863, as the realities of war exposed the falseness of romantic sentimentalism but they clung to war positive symbolism to imbue their service with meaning and to meet the expectations of civilians on the home front who were not necessarily um, able to view the scenes that they encountered. Those who shifted away from the popular stylistic strategies foreshadowed their distinguished contemporaries who were recognized for their pioneering war art and literature, like Winslow Homer and Ambrose Bierce. Collectively, Civil War soldier artists produced what remains a neglected grassroots visual record of the Civil War. Thank you. James, thank you so much for that. That was so in depth on a, on a part of the Civil War that I certainly was not very familiar with. So appreciate that. Thank you. Um, we do have uh, time for a few questions. So mm -hmm. for our uh, viewers today, if you have any questions for James, you can of course add them here. I will follow up via email with the recording that will allow you to, to ask more questions as they come to you. So we do have one here, James, from uh, Michael Vidlack. Is there a way to search in the VMHC catalog for the sketches and images discussed here by company and unit? Unfortunately not. Um, one of the best ways to find um, imagery that's, that's held in our collections would be to go to the researcher resources on the library page and to download the Civil War Manuscripts Guide there. And from that document, you'll actually be able to do keyword searches for words like drawing, sketches, things like that, and that will bring up those references. Um, but I will say that one of the challenges in this work has, in this research that I've done, has been oftentimes the pictures made by Civil War soldiers, and this is not just at the VMHC, but in repositories all over the country, it's often kind of seen as secondary to the soldier's written word, which is kind of privileged in, in many studies of the Civil War. And so what you find that a lot of this work entails is actually just carefully reading through countless letters, diaries, looking for those sketches that appear um, and looking for those references to visual culture and art um, uh, in, in the soldiers' materials themselves. But you'll sometimes find those references, but they can also be tucked away. At the same time, I'd also say that if you drop me an email, I'd be very happy to uh, share you know, the call numbers so that you could come and look at them yourselves. And I'd also note that some of the images that I discussed were from our unprocessed collections. And so therefore they won't actually be available in the catalog, but there are ways that we can, we can pull them so they can be served to patrons as well. Mm -hmm. All right, and then we do have another question here. Uh, will and 
you don't have to know the answer to this, James, mm -hmm. but you can give your give your oh. thoughts on it. Will the VMHC have a show at some point featuring this art? I would love that. I'll I'll have to yeah I'll have to write a pitch and send it upstairs because I mean one of one of the wonderful things about this project is um, the the art and the visual culture that I've shown you today is a fraction of what you can see in our collections at the VMHC and is an even more minute fraction of all the wonderful um, visual culture produced by Civil War soldiers during the Civil War. So the Library of Congress, the Newbury Library, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and all these countless smaller historical societies and archives across the country just have voluminous collections of wonderful imagery produced by soldiers, which I personally think would make a really wonderful exhibition. So I'll, I'll definitely be an advocate for that. <laughs> well, and I know that we have we do have some of our curators on on the call today, so I'm sure they're they're taking there notes. Go. All right. Well, I do want to honor everyone's time. It is 11, so we will wrap up here. But again, if there are follow-up questions for James or just the museum in general, you can reach out to us via email. Um, I do see there is, we do have one last question, which James, maybe you can give a quick, quick answer to. Is there a way to see if any of these soldiers continued as, as artists after the war? Yes. Yeah, so, um, that can sometimes be quite tricky. Um, if, if we think about the records that relate to Civil War soldiers, oftentimes what we have in archives usually just centers around their time as soldiers in the conflict. But when you start doing that biographical research, um, you can find instances uh, where soldiers continue to draw. Um, so Thomas Place, for example, that scrapbook I showed and some of the illustrations in there, he continued on that project and compiled all of his wartime pictures into a ginormous scrapbook after the war. And that was kind of his, his way of processing his experiences, of collating them, and of ensuring that they were going to be um, preserved and, and, and kept safe. We do see other individuals. Um, Charles Wellington Reed is a really good example. Um, his papers are at the Library of Congress. And they're beautiful because nearly every letter he sent home, he illustrated in one way or another. He actually ends up becoming an illustrator after the conflict and illustrates several prominent Civil War soldiers' post-war memoirs. So soldiers are really, really um, fixated on ensuring that when they do produce their memoirs in the post-war period, they can call upon soldiers who, who know what the real war looks like so that those depictions can be as accurate as possible. All right, well, thank you for that. Great. Uh, all right, so we are gonna wrap up here, but again, if there are more questions that come up, uh, James is available via email. I know he'd love to chat with any of you in person at the library, he's in the library all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also have some upcoming library specific programs that will be happening in this month and next month mm -hmm. and the month after. So you can check all of our upcoming events on our website, virginiahistory.org. And hopefully you are also subscribed to our email list as members. So for time constraints, I won't go into upcoming events, but know that we have a lot going on and you can meet James in person at, um, at live events in the library. Thank you all so much for joining us today for this program. James, thank you so much for a very thought provoking program. Uh, I know I enjoyed it a lot. And for all of our members, I hope to see you at an upcoming event, either in person at the museum or another upcoming virtual program. Our next curator conversation will be in two months in June. And with that, I will wrap up and hope everyone has a very good rest of their day. And I will see you all soon. Take care. Thank you, everyone.